Assalamu alaikum, my dear brothers and sisters, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <clears throat> I'd like to welcome you to our 13th and final session on the tafsir of Surah Fatir. Uh, we've reached uh, verses, uh, verse 42. Uh, there are 45 verses in this chapter. So inshallah, we'll be able to, uh, to complete uh, and finish our reflection on the surah uh, today. Uh, so verse number 42, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وأقسم بالله جهد أيمانهم لإن جاءهم نذير ليكونن أهدا من إحدى الأمم فلما جاءهم نذير ما زادهم إلا نفورا And they swore by God their strongest oaths that if a warner came to them they would be more guided than any of the previous nations. But when a warner came to them, it did not increase them except in aversion. Now the, the primary audience in this verse, uh, the primary audience are the, is the, uh, the Meccans, the Quraysh. And interestingly, when you look at Quraysh, when you look at the Meccans, it seems that there was, according to the, the commentators of the Quran, they say that there was a conversation that took place between them and presumably Ahlul Kitab, especially uh, the Israelites. And <clears throat> when they heard that the Israelites used to reject and deny their prophets, they, they said that if God were to send us a prophet, if you were to send a prophet to us, to Quraysh, to the Meccans, we would have accepted them and we would be more guided than you, than the Ahlul Kitab, than those previous nations who rejected uh, the messengers. So Allah says, وَأَقْسَمُ بِاللَّهِ جَهْدَ أَيْمَانِهِمْ Now, Ayman is the plural of yameen. And yameen literally means uh, right hand, but of course it, uh, it metaphorically refers to an oath. Presumably because when people take oaths, they place their right hands, uh, they put their right hands up or they place it on a scripture. وَأَقْسَمُ بِاللَّهِ جَهْدَ إِيمَانِهِمْ They make a very strong oath that if a warner came to them, and Navir here refers to you know messengers and prophets, if a prophet came to them, because remember the Quraysh, the Meccans, the Arabs were not, they did not really receive any universal messengers. So if you look at all of the other prophets, many of them were sent to Bani Israel. We don't really have, you know, at least. Uh, according to the Quran, that this the, the Meccans were a people who were not recipients of a universal messenger. You know that that's why many of them they were following the uh, the Abrahamic way or what they believed to be the Abrahamic way. So you have essentially at least two two to three thousand about two two thousand years where there is no messenger sent. To, uh, to these people. So they say that if God were to send us a warner, we, we, we would be more guided than any of the previous nations. Now, if you go back to verses 30, 38 to 41, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke of the, the kuffar and specifically their denial of Tawheed, and specifically Tawheed al-Rububiyya. So verses 38 to 41 spoke of the disbelievers' denial of God's oneness in terms of his lordship. So they believe in his oneness as the only creator, but they believed that other lesser deities uh, functioned and, uh, and managed the affairs of creation. So those verses, those previous verses spoke about their kuf with respect to rububiyyah, the oneness of God's lordship. 
Whereas in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sheds light on their denial of the Prophet. So before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, they only denied uh, monotheism. They denied tawheed, and specifically tawheed al rububiyya the, the, the monotheism of, of lordship and, and sustaining creation. And afterwards, after the Prophet was sent to them, they denied the Prophet, and hence, this is why the, the verse says, but when a warner came to them, it did not increase them except in aversion. Because prior to this, they were kuffar with respect to Tawheed al rububiyya when, when the Prophet came and invited them towards God, by rejecting him, it, it only increased their aversion and it, it, it increased uh, their kuf. Now, this, so according to some accounts, the Meccans had criticized the Jews because there were many Jews who were living uh, in Yathrib, which is the ancient name for the city of Medina. So there were interactions between uh, the Meccans and the, and the Jews. And many of the Meccans were familiar with the stories of the past prophets who were persecuted and even killed by the Israelites. So the Meccans criticized the Jews, claiming that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were to send them, if God were to hypothetically send them a messenger or a warner, they would not deny the messenger in the same way that previous communities had denied their messengers. And this is very similar to, uh, to th there are also other verses in the Quran that echo this, this message, that it seems that the Meccans have this belief that if God were to have tested us, we would fare better than you guys. So for example, in Surah Al-An'am, Verse 157, Allah says, minhum. Or lest you should say, if the book had been sent down upon us, we would surely have been better guided than they. You know, this was the sentiment among the mushrikeen. فَقَدْ جَاءَهُمْ بَيِّنَةٌ مِّن رَبِّكُمْ وَهُدًا وَرَحْمَةٌ now there has come to you a clear proof from your Lord, a guidance and a mercy. Until the end of the verse. So again, the Meccans believed, they had this confidence in themselves that if God were to try us in the same way that he tried other communities, you know, we would we would believe in the prophets, we would accept them, and we would be more guided uh, than others. And what's interesting is that this attitude can even be applied to our relationship with the imams. You know, many of us, for instance, we say that you know, if we were with Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam, we would not have betrayed him like many of the, the people of Kufa. I mean, this is essentially the same thing that the Mushrikeen are saying to the, to the Jews and to, and to other nations. That if God, that if God were to send us a warner, we would have been more guided. So it's similar to this idea that if I was living during the time of the Prophet, you know, I would have never ran away during the battle of Uhud. If I was living during the time of Imam al Hussein, I would not have abandoned him the way that others abandoned him. Now, it's easy to talk. It's easy to make claims. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, here he says, فَلَمَّا So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested that claim. But when a warner came to them, it did not increase them except in aversion. So even when we think about our relationship to the Prophet or to the Imams, you know, maybe we would have been among those who ran and fled in the Battle of Uhud. 
You know, there's a, there's a story about a man who, who used to fervently wish that he was with uh, Imam al Hussein and his companions on the day of Ashura. And he would, he would passionately recite that line of Ziyara, Ya Laytana Kunna Ma'akum Fanafuza Fawzan Azima, that we wish we had the opportunity to be with you so we can achieve a great success. So this man had a dream and he sees, he has this vivid dream and he finds himself on, the, on it's the day of Ashura, it's the, the land of Karbala. He's there with Imam al Hussein and his companions and the time of prayer, it's the time of Salat al Dhuhr. So in the dream, he he finds that Imam al Hussein had requested him to stand and guard the Imam and the other worshippers during the prayer. So he says that I stood and the Imam recited Takbiratul Ihram and one of the one of the archers in the army of Umar ibn Sa'd, and this is all in the dream, but the point is that there's an important lesson here. He says, I stood there and an archer shot an arrow towards the Imam. And when the arrow came towards me, I moved and the arrow hit Imam al Hussein. And then there was another arrow that was shot. And I, I kept on dodging the arrows and the arrows kept on hitting the body of Imam al Hussein, and he woke up and he thought to himself that, you know, I've been lying to myself when I say that, you know, I wish that I was with you. I, I would have been, you know, uh, a source of agony for the Imam. I would have failed the Imam. So the point is that sometimes we have, we, we're, we're, not, we're not able to accurately assess and evaluate ourselves. You know, some of us are very good at judging others, but we're not good at judging ourselves. So these Meccans, these Quraysh, they, they swore these very passionate oaths. They made strong oaths that if a warner came to us, we would submit, we would listen, we would be more guided than uh, previous nations. But then when, when a prophet did come, with a message that jeopardized their interests when it challenged the social order that had given them privilege, you know, they, they stood against him. So the, really the, the message of this verse is that it's easy to, to talk. It's easy to make claims, but those claims especially those claims that are related to faith and iman will inevitably be tested uh, in this life and, and you'll you'll realize that oftentimes we you know we have we make very generous evaluations of ourselves verse number 43 now why is it that before the advent of the prophet even the the mushrikeen of mecca were confident that they would believe, you know, contrary to the way that the Israelites treated their prophets, the Quraysh, the Meccans believe that if God sends us a prophet, we will obey them and we will be a model community. We will be more guided than them, than our predecessors. Verse 43, وَلَا يَحِيقُ الْمَكْرُ السَّيِّئُ إِلَّا بِأَهْلِهِ فَهَلْ يَنْظُرُونَ إِلَّا سُنَّةَ الْأَوَّلِينَ فَلَنْ تَجِدَ لِسُنَّةِ اللَّهِ تَبْدِيلًا وَلَنْ تَجِدَ لِسُنَّةِ اللَّهِ تَحْوِيلًا Due to arrogance, so this verse answers the question here, you know, when a, when a warner came to them, it did not increase them except in aversion. Why? 
due to arrogance. Due to arrogance in the land and plotting of evil, but the evil plot does not encompass except its own people. Then do they wait except the way of the former, former peoples, but you will never find in the way of God any change, and you will never find in the way of God any alteration. So their aversion to the truth was due to their arrogance. You know, there were many within Arabia who, who felt that, you know, Muhammad is poor, for example. We have more wealth than him. We have more power and influence than him. There are those who are richer. So their aversion to the truth was due to their arrogance. And one of the most dangerous, uh, you know, one of the reasons why takabbul is so dangerous is because it impedes our ability to see the truth. We're not able to discern. You know, it's like having something, you know, lodged in your eye. If there's something in your eye, you, you can't see clearly. So arrogance is like that thorn that's in the eye that has to be removed for you to be able to distinguish between right and wrong, between truth and falsehood. And in addition to their arrogance, so again, this is another common theme in the Quran when Allah speaks about uh, kuf, when he speaks about the rejection of truth. 99% of the time, when the Quran speaks of the rejection of truth, it's not, it's not an epistemological issue. It's not a matter of, well, they're just ignorant. The reality is that this is a moral issue. It's, there's, there's a moral problem. It's not about insufficient or deficiency in knowledge. Their aversion to the truth was due to their, to their arrogance. And in addition to their arrogance, their evil plotting, you know, when you, so if you, if you have an arrogant mentality, that is going to prevent you from seeing the truth and submitting to the truth. And if, if you do evil things, doing evil things prevents you and deprives you of guidance. You know, so when you do good, Allah facilitates your guidance. When you're humble and you do good, it facilitates your guidance. Allah facilitates your guidance. You know, there are some people that do good, but they're not humble. And sometimes you may see someone, they're really, they're nice people, they're good, but they have arrogance in them. And it's the arrogance that might be preventing them from seeing the truth, even though they may do some good. And there are others who... Who, who do evil. And even though they might not have that same level of arrogance, so you need both. You need that humility. And you have to have good deeds for Allah to give you the tawfiq of hidayah. And the, a dangerous combination is if you, when, if you have arrogance, and usually arrogance does breed evil. So when you have arrogance and you have wicked actions, plotting of evil, when you hurt other people, Allah deprives you of the tawfiq of hidayah. So their aversion to the truth is due to arrogance, takabbur, and the plotting of evil. So our actions have an impact on our souls. And, it, and one of the ways that it impacts our souls, you know, if you think of insight, basira, as the eyes of the heart, when you do evil, you blur that vision, you blur the vision of the heart. So arrogance and evil actions blur the ability of the heart to see the truth and comprehend the truth. So their aversion to the truth is due to arrogance in the land and plotting of evil. So, so again, if you look at all of those people who ended up joining the Prophet, you know, like Abu Dhar and Salman, if you look at their biographies, you'll find that, yeah, they may have made mistakes here and there, but generally they were humble even before they accepted Islam and they did good deeds. And therefore you find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, <coughs> excuse me, alhamdulillah. 
So you see that these individuals who embrace Islam, they have that humility, that element of humility, and they also did good. And therefore you find that Allah gives them the tawfiq of hidayah. So due to arrogance in the land and plotting of evil, but the evil plot does not encompass except its own people. Then do they wait except the way of the former, former peoples, but you will never find in the way of God any change, and you will never find in the way of God any alteration. Now, what's interesting about takabbu is that it has an impact on your spiritual intelligence. And spiritual intelligence is really the ability to comprehend and submit to the truth. You know, someone may be intellectually intelligent, but they're spiritually, you know, uh, they're unintelligent. So arrogance has an impact on a person's spiritual intelligence. I Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, he says, ما دخل قلب مرئن شيء من الكب إلا نقص من عقله مثل ما دخله من ذلك ألا ذلك أو كثر. Imam al-Baqir says, if any amount of arrogance enters the heart of a person, it will only bring deficiency to the intellect. And here the intellect is that faculty that allows us to know things and specifically the faculty that allows us to differentiate between truth and falsehood. So if any amount of arrogance enters the heart of a person, it will only bring deficiency to the intellect with the same amount of what entered it, whether it be a little or a lot. So even a little bit of arrogance causes a deficiency in the intellect. And of course, as the arrogance grows, the, the power of the intellect is, uh, is compromised. So again, going back to these, the, the, the factors that elicit uh, divine guidance. So, so if arrogance and causing harm to others, committing evil acts, if that deprives someone of hidayah, conversely, humility and good deeds, Doing things that benefit others uh, elicits uh, that uh, that divine guidance. We've spoken about this a number of times. You know this this Quranic theme of moral uh, reflexivity, reflexivity, which is the idea of, and this is what pop culture would call karma. You know any harm that you cause to others is inevitably inflicted on your own soul. And it's not that, and from an Islamic perspective, it's not that you know, if I cause harm, if I, if, if, if I you know, uh, devise an evil plot to cause harm or to thwart you know, the plan of God, it's not that I will be punished later on. The, the, the damage that is inflicted on the soul is immediate because everything that we do is absorbed by the heart. So this is, you know, a uh, a law, you know, the law of God. There's a law that's that Allah has established in creation. That is that any harm that you unjustifiably attempt to afflict upon others, or even if you are successful in afflicting harm on others, you do that. that you do damage to your own soul. In another verse, for instance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhan nas, O people, innama baghyukum ala anfusikum. Your tyranny, when you transgress, you do it to yourselves. So we have to understand that when we do good, we are the first beneficiaries. When we do evil, when we cause harm, when we oppress, when we transgress, we are the first victims. Ya ayyuhan nas, innama baghyukum ala anfusikum. And then Allah says in the, 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 the remaining of the verse, فَلَن تَجِدَ لِسُنَّةِ اللَّهِ تَبْدِيلًا وَلَن تَجِدَ لِسُنَّةِ اللَّهِ تَحْوِيلًا But you'll never find in the way of God any change. And you will never find in the way of God any alteration. 
Sunnatullah, the Sunnah of God, the way of God, or the pol the divine policy. So this is a reference to the permanence of the laws and principles God established for creation. There are certain unchanging and fixed laws and policies that Allah has placed and established in the world of creation. And, and one of them, as was mentioned in this verse, and of course in this context, the idea that the evil that we do comes back to ourselves. This is one of the sunnahs of Allah. When you do evil, you do evil, you afflict harm upon your own soul. This is the law of God. Creation is built like this. So there's not a single instance where a creature afflicts harm upon another creature and is totally uh, protected or uh, can operate with uh, impunity. That the, the damage that is inflicted upon the soul is, uh, is a natural result of that transgression. So in this context, the law of God it indicates both that God always allows the plotting of the disbelievers to close in on them. You plan in your plot and then that, that evil plotting comes back to haunt you. This is a divine law that has been set. And that the outcome is something that's decreed. That this is something that has been decreed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now in, in Tafsir al-Mizan, there is a, uh, an excerpt that I want to share where Allama speaks about uh, this, uh, this, what it means for the policy of God to change. Because Allah says that there is no change in the divine policy. So he says, تَبْدِيلُ السُنَّةِ أَن تُوضَعَ The changing of, of a divine policy, of the way of God, entails bestowing prosperity and blessings in a place that necessitates punishment. So changing the law of God would mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards the transgressions of Fir'aun and punishes the good deeds and the struggles of Musa, that there's that they're not compensated fairly. No, the sunnah of Allah dictates that what Fir'aun reaps, what, what he sows, he will reap. And the good that Musa sows, he will reap. Whether it's witnessed in this life or the hereafter, that is the law of God. The law of God is that you reap what you sow. وَتَحْوِيلُهَا أَنْ يَنْقُلَ الْعَذَابِ مِنْ قَوْمٍ يَسْتَحِقُونَهُ إِلَىٰ غَيْرِهِمْ So again, its alteration is to transfer the punishment upon a group which is deserving of it to another group. So the, the تَحْوِيل, the alteration of, uh, of the, the law of God is to say that you know, God rewards a group that deserves to be punished and punishes a group that deserves to be rewarded. And of course, the policy of God neither changes nor is altered. Now, again, from, from, from reading this statement of Allah, it seems that uh, the tabdeel and the tahweel are, uh, are pretty, pretty similar. And Allah knows best. So again, another example of this sunnah of God is that if God punishes someone for a, a sin, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not discriminate. So for example, Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says, فَاعْتَبِرُوا بِمَا كَانَ مِنْ فِعْلِ إِبْلِيسِ فَاعْتَبِرُوا بِمَا كَانَ مِنْ فِعْلِ اللَّهِ بِإِبْلِيسِ Take lesson from what God did to Satan. إِذْ أَحْبَطَ عَمَلَهُ الطَّوِيلِ وَجَهْدَهُ الْجَهِيدِ عَنْ كِبْرِ سَاعَةٍ وَاحِدَةٍ He foiled, he spoiled his many deeds and his hard-working efforts for being arrogant for an instant. فَمَنْ ذَا بَعْدِ إِبْلِيسِ يَسْلَمُ عَلَى اللَّهِ بِمِثْلِ مَحْصِيَتِهِ so after Satan, who will be saved from God's wrath 
with something like his sin. So this idea of the sunnah of God not changing, one aspect of it is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you are like Satan, in the sense that you're arrogant and you don't repent, why do you think that God would not hold you accountable in the way that he holds him accountable? That if Allah is going to punish shaytan for his arrogance, if you yourself are arrogant, accept Except, uh, expect a similar punishment. Why? Because there is no tabdeel, there's no change in the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is one aspect of it. You know, and, and again, another aspect of, of the sunnah of Allah is that, you know, there are certain consequences for actions that are set by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are natural consequences uh, for certain sins. So there are certain sins, thalathatun, there's a hadith from the Prophet, thalathatun min al-dhunub tu'ajjalu uqubatuha wa la tu'akharu ila al-akhir. There are three sins whose punishment is hastened in the life of this world and it is not delayed until the hereafter. So again, this is an example of one of the laws of God. Among the laws of Allah is that there are certain sins whose consequences are experienced in dunya even before akhirah. There are other sins where we may not sense or experience its uh, its uh, its consequences. So insolence to one's parents, the effect of that. The consequence of that behavior is experienced in dunya even before the akhir. And to transgress, to trample over the rights of others. Again, in some way, in some form, you will taste the chastisement for that sin in this life. And to be uh, ungrateful for uh, a blessing or a favor. Again, these are sins that are experienced, the consequences of which are experienced in alam al dunya. And this goes back to this theme of how the sunnah of Allah does not change. There are certain laws and divine policies that are in place that are not altered and will not and will not change. Verse 44. وَلَمْ يَسِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ فَيَنْظُرُوا كَيْفَ كَانَ عَاقِبَةُ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ وَكَانُوا أَشَدَّ مِنْهُمْ قُوَّةً وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُعْجِزَهُ مِنْ شَيْءٍ وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُعْجِزَهُ مِنْ شَيْءٍ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَلَا فِي الْأَرْضِ إِنَّهُ كَانَ عَلِيمًا قَدِيرًا Have they not traveled through the land and observed how was the end of those before them? And they were greater than them in power. But God is not caused to be, but God is not to be caused failure by anything in the heavens or on the earth. Indeed, He is ever knowing and powerful. So again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here, and this is again another common theme in the Quran, where Allah mentions the fate of the past nations. The fate of the guilty, the corrupt, the wrongdoers, and those who ultimately denied God's messengers. Uh, and Allah mentions this as an ad admonition to the disbelievers. And in every generation, you know, we have to, you know, one aspect of reflection is to think about the fate of those who came before us. So again, those. Before them, in this context, when Allah is speaking to the Quraysh, you know, Allah is speaking about those previous tribes and peoples who were destroyed, despite being mightier than those who are opposing the Prophet now. You know, Ad and Thamud, these were massive civilizations who resisted and who refused to accept the truth that was being articulated by their respective prophets and 
we saw their uh, their civilizations uh, decline, and they were ultimately destroyed. In Sermon 31 of uh, Nahjul Balagha, this is an excerpt from that uh, that letter. So this is, I'm sorry, letter 31 of uh, of Nahjul Balagha. It's a letter that he, Imam Amir al-Mu'minin writes to one of his sons. It's debated about. It's debated, uh, you know, what what son he's speaking to. But this was after his return from the Battle of Safin. He writes a letter, presumably to either Imam al Hassan or Muhammad ibn al Hanafiya. In any case, the Imam says he speaks about the importance of reflecting on the past. And the Imam says, Ya Bunay, inni wa in lam akun umirtu umara man kana kabli, faqad nawartu fi a'malihim. وَفَكَّرْتُ فِي أَخْبَارِهِمْ وَسِرْتُ فِي آثَارِهِمْ O oh my dear son, even though I have not lived as long as those before me. Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen, he lived for 63 lunar years. There are many people who lived longer uh, than Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. So the Imam says, even though I haven't lived as long as those who came before me, Yet I examined their actions. Imam says, I thought deeply about their actions and I contemplated over their news. I thought about their affairs. I walked among their ruins till I felt that I was one of them. And then the Imam says, Hatta uttu ka'ahadihim. The Imam says that I I." I reflected so much over the fate of past people, of those who came before me, so much that, that I felt that I was one of them. And he says that it's you know it's almost as though. You know, I've thought about the past so much that I feel as though I've lived with them, that I was living from the beginning of the story of man until the last day. You know, this shows you how much Amir al-Mu'mineen used to think about, uh, you know, the, about history, about the affairs of, uh, of the past. And then he says... فَعَرَفْتُ صَفْوَ ذَلِكَ مِنْ كَدَرِهِ وَنَفْعَهُ مِنْ ضَرَرِهِ I have therefore been able to discern the impure from the clean and the benefit from the harm. He says, by reflecting and pondering over history, I was able to come to certain conclusions about what actions facilitate you know, the purity of the heart, what actions bring about impurity to the heart, what are those actions that bring about benefit what are those actions that that cause harm so the point is that this is the meaning of of taf this is one of the meanings of tafakkur it's to think and draw lessons from the experiences of those who came before us and then verse uh, number 45 you know my, my throat is a bit sore so i'm i'm sorry if i have to speed up a little bit i don't want to lose my voice in the middle of class uh, verse number 45 وَلَوْ يُؤَاخِذُ اللَّهُ النَّاسَ بِمَا كَسَبُوا مَا تَرَكَ عَلَىٰ ظَهْرِهَا مِنْ دَابَّ وَلَاكِنْ يُؤَخِّرُهُمْ إِلَىٰ أَجَلٍ مُسَمَّى فَإِذَا جَاءَ أَجَلُهُمْ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ بِعِبَادِهِ بَصِيرًا And if God were to punish the people for what they have earned, He would not leave upon the earth any creature. But he defers them for a specified term. And when their term comes, then indeed God has ever been of his servants seeing. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the most <clears throat> underappreciated aspects of Allah's rahmah, of Allah's mercy, is that Allah gives human beings time. He doesn't recompense us 
for our acts of disobedience immediately. Meaning that when we commit a sin, Allah doesn't immediately punish us, even though he has every right to. But we transgress and Allah gives us, he grants us respite. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were to swiftly punish us for our transgressions, no creature would remain on the face of the earth. So one important aspect of Allah's rahmah is the fact that Allah is sabur, that Allah is halim, that Allah is forbearing. He, he gives us time. We make mistakes, we sin, and He gives us time to rectify ourselves. And, and again, this is you know, one aspect of Allah's rahmah that, that really deserves gratitude. That Allah gives us time. He doesn't, you know, it's not it's not a one strike out policy. We make mistakes and Allah continues to give us uh, time. Now, when you go back to the verse, Allah says, and if God were to punish the people for what they have earned, he would not leave upon the earth any creature. So th this part of the ayah has raised a lot of questions among the mufassirin. Now, some scholars say that uh, Dab Bahir, a creature here, refers to human beings and jinn. Uh, because they're the only ones who are accountable before God uh, because of their free will. But again, I think this is a, a, a weak opinion. Uh, because, you know, uh, in Dab in the, uh, in the Arabic language, in classical Arabic, refers to anything that that inhabits its, uh, inhabits the earth and roams upon the earth. Now, other scholars contend that creatures refer to all creatures who will, you know, when human beings sin, all creatures uh, suffer inevitably. You know, if we look at the, the flood of Nuh, you know, most of the creatures, uh, most of the animals perished in that, uh, in that flood. Now, so it is proposed that the elimination of creatures, so some Mufassirin make a very good point here. They say that the elimination of creatures is part of the punishment for human beings because the other animals on earth, the other creatures on earth are a means of provision for human beings. So when Allah eradicates certain creatures for the, the misdeeds of human beings, it's not that Allah is punishing those creatures. They perish, and their perishing is part of the punishment for human beings. You know, in the same way, if there's, if there's a drought, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sometimes, sometimes he, deprives, uh, he just deprives us of, of rain. And we have a hadith that mentioned that one of the possible reasons why uh, rain is, is withheld, of course, you know, this can also be explained through... Uh, through the, through the natural sciences, but there's there's no uh, you know th there's no contradiction here, because we know that there are metaphysical laws that govern the physical laws. In any case, we do have narrations that speak about how certain sins deprive uh, human beings of rainfall. Now, when rain doesn't fall, what typically happens? Crops die and livestock dies. So the death of livestock, you know, is, for example, a part of the punishment for human beings, since these creatures, they're a sort, they're a type of rizq uh, for human beings. And also some Mufassirin say that their elimination from the surface of the earth can also indicate the severity of the punishment to the point that the lives of human beings are integrated with those of the creatures around them so that if a punishment descends upon them, it affects all other uh, forms of life. Uh, with that, uh, we conclude our discussion on the tafsir of Surat uh, Fatir. And uh, my voice uh, has run out of gas as well. But uh, inshallah, I pray that uh, you found these, uh, these reflection sessions to be enlightening and uh, inshallah, uh, beginning next week, if Allah gives us the, the, the tawfiq, 
we will commence with a detailed uh, lecture series on the biography of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa and uh, and and you know studying the life of the Prophet will in no way be a, a departure from uh, these conversations about the Quran. In fact, as I had indicated to uh, to Brother Zain, you know, the life of the Prophet, the seerah, is in fact the backdrop of the Quran. Uh, this will, inshallah, enhance our appreciation of the Quran. And by covering the life of the Prophet in elaborate depth, we will actually be able to cover uh, many of the verses of the Quran in a chronological order. So the tafs the, the Sira lectures will actually uh, will be able to incorporate a, a great deal of, uh, of Quran uh, into our discussions. Um, so with that, if there are any uh, questions or comments, and I might I might have to limit <clears throat> the Q and A today because uh, my uh, my uh, my throat is a bit sore today. So if there are any uh, questions, uh, we can address them now. Uh, yeah, please just let me know if you want, whenever you want to end the Q and A early, so that that'll be perfectly all right. But uh, well, first question. If both jinn and humans have free will, why do we think we are better than all creatures, including jinn? So <clears throat> we don't see, there's, there's a difference between, so th there may be individual jinns. In fact, we know that among jinns, there are mu'mineen. So a believing jinn, a mu'min jinn, is superior to a human being who is not mu'min. You know, that's very clear. Now, I think that a deeper question would be, in general, which creation is superior in, in general? It seems that human beings are superior as a species over jinn, because when you look at the, the Quran, number one, you see that Allah commands the angels to prostrate to Adam. We don't have any indication that such a command was given to the angels to prostrate to jinn. So individual jinns may be superior to human beings, but it seems that human beings have greater spiritual potential. You know, this is why, you know, if you look at jinn and human beings, the Ahlul Bayt, who are the greatest of God's creation, they belong to the to uh, to the human the human race as opposed to the uh, the uh, the jinn. So, because you have people among human beings who have reached high spiritual stations, this is perhaps why the human beings are seen as. In general, they're seen as being superior to uh, to jinn, perhaps because of their their potential of of uh, gaining nearness to God and their potential to to manifest the uh, the attributes of God. But on an individual level, yes, there may be certain jinn who are superior to human beings, but as a whole, human beings have seem to have higher potential and. Of course, the greatest of God's creation belong to uh, to to that creation, to the to human beings in the form of the Ahlul Bayt. This question is about verse forty-three. Um, could, you, uh, could you please clarify this understanding? Like, it sounds like you're, you said that um, good deeds benefit you by opening up your heart to the truth. So, if you have certain character traits, which might be preventing you from being open to the truth, just like this arrogance, then that is why the good deeds won't benefit you because the main purpose of the good deeds is how they are, or the main benefit of the good deeds comes from how they actually are affecting your soul and your spirit. spirit. So it, you can't say that, that good deeds have no benefit because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards people for doing good. Even someone who's, a, an atheist who's corrupt and who 
who's arrogant, you know, if someone does something good, they will reap the benefit of that good, whether it's in this life or the hereafter. Now, if it's someone, you know, rejects God and uh, th that that benefit may be experienced in uh, in dunya. So one of the functions of so good deeds have intrinsic value, but one of the benefits of good deeds is that, you know, assuming that it's it's coupled with humility, is that number one, doing good, you know, preserves a person's faith. Right? This is why, you know, it, so one so one of the one factor to consider is that when Allah you know speaks about Iman and Amal Salih, you know, so we need Iman to do good deeds, meaning that having faith kind of give, gives us guidance and allows us to discern between what's right and what's wrong. But but doing good deeds also preserves that faith. You know, so if someone is just a Muslim by name and, and they just commit evil all their lives, there's a very good chance that they might they might relinquish that iman. So doing good plays a role in preserving faith. And it also, as you mentioned, if, if someone is humble but doesn't have faith, this may give them the tawfiq. It may Allah may facilitate their uh, their discovery of the truth because of those traits. Now, if someone is arrogant and does good, that that still benefits them in some way. Now, it might prevent them from from seeing the truth, but they will definitely uh, benefit, even at least in their worldly life, from uh, from the good that they do. So, if someone is arrogant, but let's say they give charity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may protect them from certain bala, from a certain calamity because of that charity. So the charity has, has an intrinsic value. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. And um, on verse 42, you're uh, talking about how... Uh, our mindset would be very different um, if, if, if we were uh, actually in the there with the time of the prophet. Can I make you wonder, we, we hear about how the time, the, the test during our present time uh, is harder because we're having to believe without actually being in the presence of the prophet or the imams. But it makes you wonder how, if that is always the case. You know, th there are... <clears throat> There are, you know, when we speak about the ahadith of, of Akhir al-Zaman, many people assume that, you know, it's all doom and gloom and, you know, people are going to have weak iman and so on and so forth and haq and batil will be mixed and it will be difficult to dis distinguish right from wrong. And this is all true. You know, I, I think that, you know, the ahadith that speak about the end of times definitely give us a very... Uh, you know, dystopian picture of the world. But in addition to that, we do have a hadith that mention the state of mu'mineen in Akhir al-Zaman. And there are some mu'mineen who, who have such firm faith and strong conviction that their imam would not change whether they see the imam or they don't see the imam. So we, we can't forget that those who maintain their faith during the ghayba are actually the greatest among among the people meaning that they're they're the, they are the best of followers so there are some mu'minin who maintain their faith in akhir zaman and they they're considered the the elite of all of the uh, the companions of them but, but but the question is are we able to maintain our iman uh, in in this uh, the state of, of great occultation that's where that's the real question if someone is able to and we have, we, we even have a hadith from the prophet and this is even mentioned in sunni hadith literature where the prophet was sitting with his companions and he he says you know assalamu alaykum ya akhwani assalamu ala akhwani peace be upon my brothers my brethren my brothers and my sisters and the companions of the Prophet, assuming that the Prophet was addressing them, they said, Wa alayka salam, ya Rasulullah. And peace be upon 
you too, O, o messenger of God. And the prophet said to them that I'm not talking to you. I'm speaking about, you know, those who will be born in the future, who will believe in me and will have full conviction and faith in my message, yet they have never seen me. So if we can maintain our iman uh, in, in our current times, then, then such people have a high status with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They, they are definitely the spiritual uh, elite. But it, it, it does make you wonder, you know, when, you, when we read about the, uh, the Prophet and the Imams of Ahmed al-Bayt, you know, it's easy to make claims. And each person knows themselves. And, and maybe we don't know. Maybe we have to be tested for us uh, to know. But uh, you know, there, there's a beautiful statement from Imam al-Baqa where someone comes to him and says to him, Ya ibn Rasulullah, you know, the Imam is in Medina and he says that you know you have you have so many followers in Kufa and they're solid believers. If you if you give them an order, they'll obey. So the Imam, this man is trying, he's implying that you know, why don't we try, why don't we rise up and fight the Umayyads or the Abbasids, the Umayyads? So the Imam says to this man that you know so so he says to him that those believers who are in kufa are they the types of believers who are able to put their hands in each other's pockets and take what they need from each other without them being suspicious of each other and uh, the man said no you know we, we, our brotherhood is not is not that strong. So the Imam says, if if they can't sacrifice their wealth for each other, then they will be stingier with their blood. So that it's that's a very uh, it's an eye opening hadith, and it's true. You know, if some of us are not willing to part with our money, so if you're not willing to part with your money and to, and give up things that that you're addicted to or that are very dear to you, chances are that you're not going to put yourself in danger uh, when the imam reappears, if that is what is required of you. So it's it's it really makes you think about uh, your own state. And uh, and we should be thinking about these, these things on a regular basis. You know, you know, tafakkur, one aspect of tafakkur and uh, muhasaba is that, you know, when you take account of yourself and your deeds, you should ask, you know, uh, and think about what you did during that day, what your goal is as a human being, and and really reflect on your relationship with Allah, reflect on your relationship with your family, with your community. So uh, we definitely need more uh, more introspection to be able to kind of come up with uh, with an answer to these questions. Thank you. And in verse 45, uh, is that verse also applicable to Surah Hud, verse 119, where Allah says, I will surely fill hell with jinn and humans altogether? Um, does that relate to verse 45? Uh, yes, that's the question. No, so this is not. So the verse 45 is basically speaking about uh, dunya, that in, in this life, if God were to to uh, to punish people for what they've earned, He would not leave upon the earth any creature. So, so it's it's speaking about the mercy of God deferring punishment and giving us the opportunity to repent to Him. That one aspect of Allah's mercy is that He doesn't immediately punish us when we commit sins. You know, and and this happens every single day. People commit sins every day, but Allah doesn't annihilate them. He gives them, he gives them time. He gives them opportunities to repent. Uh, thank you very much, Sheikh. Jazakumullah. Uh, thank you so much, Brother Zain, again for all of your your hard work, and thank. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for for tuning in, and I look forward to uh, to starting our. Uh, our lecture series on the uh, the biography of the prophet jazakumullah
Thank you very much, uh, Sheikh. Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum, sister. How are you? Well, Sheikh, uh, please, for all of us. And uh, the small little uh, prescription suggestion to you is uh, Maxofan for your throat and to build your immunity, Sheikh. Uh, yes, uh, in hot, hot boiling water, add about a quarter teaspoon of turmeric powder and quarter teaspoon of dried ginger and a pinch of uh, crushed pepper. Okay, perfect. And, I, I have all of those ingredients, alhamdulillah. And bring this hot, hot like tea for three, uh, four times, uh, no, for about four, five nights before you sleep. And then do not have water or anything on top of that. Just have wow. that and then go off to sleep. And inshallah, inshallah. Uh, with was, uh, inshallah, you will uh, feel much better. Thank you so much. That's very kind of you. Please keep me in your dua and I look forward to seeing you guys next week. And take very good care of yourself. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum.